Well, good afternoon and warm greetings from Chicago to all assembled uh, in the special place. Um, before we proceed, though, let us focus our prayer on an unfolding situation. We pray for the people of Ukraine, for justice and peace in the region to prevail, and for diplomacy and bridge building, not violence, to carry the last word. Mary, untire of knots and queen of peace, pray for us. And so good afternoon. And let me add good morning and good evening as this is truly a global event. And we are delighted to have so many on this call, whether you are viewing on your phone or from one of the many university watch parties happening around the world, our warmest of welcomes, one and all, to Building Bridges North-South, a synodal encounter between Pope Francis and university students. My name is Michael Murphy, and it is my great honor to serve as director of the Joan and Bill Hanks Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. And on behalf of university leadership, our president, Dr. Joanne Rooney, Provost Margaret Callahan, deans Peter Schrader and Peter Jones of CAS and IPS, and chair Bob DeVito from the Department of Theology, uh, also Jeremy Langford and his Crackerjack team from University Marketing and Communications, I extend a warm Loyola welcome. An additional welcome on behalf of our event co-hosts at the Pontifical Commission for Latin America, especially Secretary Dr. Emilce Cuda, who has been our core partner for many months now and so instrumental in setting the stage for today's historic dialogue. Thank you, Emilce. Thank you also to our core faculty team who has worked so well with each other, with our beloved students, and with the Holy Spirit to bring this event to fruition. Dr. Kuda, Dr. Peter Jones, who's the Dean of the Institute for Pastoral Studies, Dr. Felipe Legareta, faculty at IPS, and my colleague in theology, the Honorable Miguel Diaz, ambassador to the Holy See, retired. Uh, wow, what a privilege to work with you. What a great team and uh, saludos. Um, dear Holy Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for accepting our invitation and for following our preparation so closely. What a gift it is for our students to be in synodal conversation with you. Profound gratitude, Papa Francisco, and welcome to Loyola University of uh, Chicago, you know, virtually. Um, and to you, uh, our dear students uh, in our working groups, all 130 of you from the 58 universities and 21 countries that you represent, your companion faculty facilitators say a collective thank you. Your insight, creativity, imagination, and compassion are a blessing to us all and 11 to a world so direly in need. Well done, my friends, and best of luck today. Just to be a brief background and a note on our format before we begin our program. Uh, the conversations today are the very expression of synodality already in progress. The focus of our working groups is on care of migrants and refugees. Our students, many of whom are, are migrants themselves and or our children of migrants, uh, have been at work in conversation uh, these last weeks on imagining and developing processes that justly transform environmental and economic realities related to human migration and displacement. They will share their ideas with Pope Francis today. After uh, group facilitators, uh, the faculty friends, provide brief welcomes and introductions of their student groups, one team from the North and one team from the South, in each dialogue session, both student pairs will read their student authored remarks, their concrete plans and their questions. Pope Francis will listen and then respond and engage in dialogue after both pairs have read their statements. No doubt that Pope Francis will locate and encourage the kind of bridge building with which the chair of Peter is so closely associated. For bridge building is essentially about the gospel, essentially about love and right relationship. No person is able to live without love. No person is able to live without loving. 
Hanserus von Balthasar concluded his massive theological project with four simple words, love alone is credible. Uh, Chilean teacher, poet, and diplomat, Gabriela Mistral, showed us how dialogue is, quote, an untire of knots, but that love without words is itself a knot, and it drowns. Servant of God, Dorothy Day, knew this, and so exhorted us always to prayer, so that we may have, we might have, a revolution of the heart. These things move the synodal process. It is now my honor to introduce Blaise Supich, Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. Cardinal Supich has also been following and supporting the work of our beloved students. And he is here to provide our official welcome and greetings, Cardinal Supich. Thanks so much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you and good day and welcome from the main chapel of Mundelein Seminary here in the Archdiocese of Chicago. On September the 18th, as the Bishop of Rome, Pope Francis offered a reflection on the synodal process that he has initiated as a means of renewing the church in our time. The very word synod says it all. It means journeying together. Everyone has a part to play for we are all gifted with the spirit of Christ. And it begins by each of us being in touch with the inner restlessness in our hearts. The spirit of synodality is uniquely alive in hearts and minds of young people. And so I commend the dedicated work of the seven regional groups of university students from Toronto to Mexico City, from Los Angeles to Rio de Janeiro, from New York City to Buenos Aires, who have met numerous times in advance of this gathering to share hopes and dreams and ideas. Based on their studies and dedication to dialogue, these young scholars have imagined together concrete projects that respond to the complex problems associated with immigration and migration and the suffering of refugees. We are eager to hear their insights, and we are grateful for their work. These students understand the need to build bridges as opposed to erecting walls. That is the fundamental call of the gospel. And it is so important today as we hear about war in Europe. All of this begins with the practice of listening, whether we are a parent or a priest, a catechist or religious, lay leader, bishop, young person or old. Only a synodal vision rooted in discernment, conversion and reform at every level can bring to the church the comprehensive action in the defense of the most vulnerable in our midst to which God's grace is calling us. Pope Francis says it all and so beautifully. The Holy Spirit needs us. Listen to him by listening to each other. Leave no one behind or excluded. It is profoundly inspiring to know that students are leading us in this regard. And I ask that all pray for the success of the synodal process and for the students and the Holy Father as they dialogue together today. We should not be afraid of the challenges that we face the questions we find hard to answer, but instead be prepared for surprises. For Christ the risen one is alive and active in the church and in the world and always doing something new. May God bless your work today. Thank you, Cardinal Supic, uh, much appreciated. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Emil Sekuda, Secretary of the Pontifical uh, uh, Commission for Latin America, pardon me, Emil say, welcome to the Zoom stage, my friend. Good to see you. Muchas gracias, Michael. Santo Thank Pablo. you very much, Michael. Holy Father, in uh, 2017, you said, uh, 
we are motivated to build bridges. Uh, I remember that year we came to the Holy Father to ask permission to bring ahead this project. And here we are five years after that with the students uh, from all Americas uh, sitting here with Pope Francis in this virtual square where we are all perfectly equal little boxes. Who would have guessed that this is really a concrete synodal gesture? He talks about your young, young spirit, uh, your capacity to love and fascinate. That is why I want to propose you today, the Holy Father, to talk about love. The Pontifical Commission for Latin America wants to be a bridge of communication because uh, this is uh, the point, uh, to love in image and likeness of the Holy Trinity. So it must be not only a bridge of communication between the Roman Curia and the particular churches, but also between all the Americas, inhabited by Latin Americans from north to south. So we want to participate to every synodal dialogue about uh, safeguarding the symbols of faith as well as creation. So out of love, we accept the invitation of the Loyola University to build a bridge that uh, works uh, on the causes, response to the causes of migration, which is the great tragedy of the 21st century that uh, joins all of us in pain. Out of love, we go out, we see, we hear, we touch we are the reality. And Holy Father, we get moved because of the absurd limits imposed by globalization. The world created by God, the Father, for everyone is not really for everyone. Goods, uh, capitals, uh, our assets, virus circulate, but the families do not. On the contrary, they are relocalized in production centers where work is the worst paid and without social security. And at the same time, their natural resources, which are a source of survival given by God so that everyone can live, as we read in the Aparecida document, these resources are victims of a plundering that uh, pretends to be compensated with uh, cosmetic financial solutions, uh, a false mysticism that appropriates uh, our social magisterium to put us even more in debt. And as we want to collaborate in the construction of this bridge, we wonder whether the topic of love already dealt with by Pope Benedict can be the great theological theme to be used in front of the tragedy of migrations, but always provided that we associate this topic of love with another great topic that you mentioned in uh, Fratelli Tutti, No Brothers, uh, work. Because in difference before of the structural unemployment that forces us to migrate is an act of lack of love. It is a sin. It is the opposite of happiness, the opposite of a worthy and dignitous life. So, Pope Francis, I invite you to talk about love. We listen to you. Gracias, Emilice. Bienvenidos, Pope Francis. Welcome. Welcome, Holy Father. Bienvenidos, Father. Good evening. It is really a joy. Or good morning. I don't know, according to where we are. So thank you for these words of welcome that you addressed me. Thank you, first of all, to the university students who are the heart of this dialogue. They are our life. And thanks specifically to those who organized this synodal meeting by building bridges between the north and the south. This is the vocation of Christians, to build bridges. Christ came to be the bridge between God the Father and us. A Christian faithful who does not uh, build bridges, uh, the, it means they forgot their own baptism, because to build bridges is part of our vocation. So thank you to the Loyola University of Chicago. Thank you to your eminence, Cardinal 
Kupic. I thank you for your presence here. And thanks uh, to all those who organized this event. And uh, as uh, we often say, this time uh, is not a time of uh, changes. It is a change of uh, times. So how can we manage this change of times? So what are the answers we can give? And especially how can we understand the questions that uh, we are asked today? So more than give responses, what uh, we are asked today is uh, to welcome the questions with our mind and with our heart. So the questions that life asks us and culture addresses us, human problems, we have to receive them with the mind, with the heart, and we have to respond in an intelligent way, in a heartful way, and also in a pragmatic way. So with mind, heart, and hands. So in this change of times, in order to build bridges as brothers and sisters, today we chose to deal with a a topic, migration, and we chose to deal with this topic with university students. That is, we wonder, what is the role of university students uh, in this sense, in this area? And what is the spirit, uh, what is uh, the oxygen we have to breathe so that all of these uh, can work and can, can give us hope? This is the working scheme that we want to follow today for our dialogue. So the problem of migration is one of the most serious uh, problems we have to face, we have to tackle. We see people who leave, who are forced to leave their land, who are lived to run away because of political problems or lack of work, for economic problems, for cultural problems, or even for religious issues. So this develops a whole pathway, a whole form of pilgrimage, but who welcomes these people? Who receives them? We have to understand one thing. Migrants have to be received. They must be accompanied. Migrants must be promoted and migrants must be integrated. This is the process to receive, accompany, promote, and integrate. So every country, every state must say with honesty, I can receive, for example, an X number of migrants, not more than that, than the other countries, the other states in a universal dialogue of a brotherhood should have a dialogue and understand who can welcome how many migrants. So the problems that make migrants go away are wars, political problems, lack of labor, lack of work, etc. So this is valid for all migrants. On the other hand, it is good for us to talk about this topic because we are children of migrants. I am a child of migrants. My father was a migrant from Piedmont to Argentina. When he was a young man, he was 22 years old in that time. And there he built his life in Argentina. The US uh, were born. Uh, they uh, constructed themselves uh, thanks to the migrants that are coming from Ireland, those coming from Italy, etc. So we are countries uh, built, uh, constructed by migrants. My land, Argentina, is a cocktail of migrants. It is a melting pot of migrants because uh, anyone got to Argentina. So we have to be able to have a cohabitation with them. So university students, can, how can they? tackle the topic of migration, how can they study them, how can they take uh, charge of this problem? What do these young people do? Certainly here university play a very important role. Universities with uh, all the disciplines uh, that uh, uh, have a mutual influence. We receive the heritage from enlightenment that is to nourish our mind with the concepts, with ideas. A man or a woman who just uh, fill their mind with concepts, uh, eventually they are cold, they are 
heartless because they have things only in their mind. But university students must follow their studies with the three languages, the mind, the heart, and the hands. So university life must be to think what I feel and what I do, to feel what I think and what I do, and to do what I think and what I feel. So the harmony between these three languages is the real university formation. So university students must uh, really be lively, must, uh, those who are too quiet, too calm, that do not have initiatives, uh, they are, you know, without soul. That is, uh, the university students who don't really look like uh, students. Maybe you can get it wrong, but you have to express your concerns, what uh, you have uh, within you. So what should guide university life? Starting from contemplating a problem, like the migrant. So university life with the three languages, what, uh, where should uh, it lead me in order not uh, to get it wrong? I should be guided by hope. Hope is the virtue of attraction. There is an image in the Bible that I like uh, very much. It is the image of hope. So how can we draw hope? With an anchor. I draw an anchor to me, then I get grabbed to the rope and I climb up to get into the anchor. And this gives me security. If the anchor is connected to eternal life, it guides me to eternal life. But if the anchor then gets stuck somewhere else, uh, it can create problems. And if I put it in a drawer, it doesn't bring me anywhere. So a university life without hope is like a life that we keep in a drawer. So I want to begin with dialogue with you because I like talking to young people. I become younger myself and I need youth because I'm a bit old, as you know. So this helps me to feel your voices. Thank you. Thank you, Pope Francis, for this beautiful program. I also feel younger when I talk to young people. So I give the floor now to Miguel Diaz, who will introduce the first group. Gracias, Emilce. Thank you, Emilce. Dear Pope Francis. On your first trip outside of Rome, the island of Lampedusa, you spoke a about a world that to practice compassion. Usted habló that is, to suffer with others in what you call the of indifference. La compasión. University students from Central America and the Caribbean and from the West and Pacific Coast of the Los United States have seen firsthand in Nuestra Querida America la costa, y han visto de primera mano the conditions that often threaten the life of migrants connected las to race, que a menudo age, la vida de los gender, sexual orientation, political ideologies, and the deepening environmental crisis. These social viruses spread within and outside national borders to perpetuate ongoing violence, undermine universal access to the goods of creation, and deprive persons of social economic opportunities. These students that you're about to meet are determined to see to opt and to act with and for migrants to address personal and structural barriers that undermine fundamental human dignity and human fruition. I am grateful to my coworkers, Dr. Emil Secuda, Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andrieu, and Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid for their assistance in selecting this talented group of students to participate in this synodal encounter. Papa Francisco, I now invite our four student representatives to share with you what has seized their imagination and the practical responses that they will offer us to better love our neighbors. 
Loreta Delgado Márquez, Paco Estrada, Leonardo Girón y Alejandro Palacio. Gracias, doctor Díaz, por su introducción. Mi nombre es Lorena Delgado Márquez. Soy Thank estudiante. Gracias por su introducción. Mi nombre es Lorena Delgado Márquez y soy estudiante de la Universidad de California. Solidarity with other students across this country and Latin America to denounce the social economic inequalities and the lack of educational opportunities available to migrants and children of migrants, something that universities are uniquely capable of addressing. Saludos, Papa Francisco. Mi nombre es Jesús Paco Estrada y soy estudiante en mi segundo año en la Universidad de Loyola Marymount y un graduado de la preparatoria Vernon Day Jesuit High School. I'm a student at the second year of the Yorba Marymount, the Upper Francis. As COVID-19 has shown us, we want to highlight some of the challenges migrant communities face that create dehumanizing socioeconomic conditions within our country. We ask each of our universities to make an option with and for migrants and their children by conducting research within their own university and surrounding communities to identify and listen to migrant stories the causes of their ongoing marginalization and their life-sustaining needs. Enacting this request can be the first step to tackle the critical challenges of access to education and technology, job creation, and fostering socioeconomic justice for migrants. We propose developing and or multiplying partnerships between universities and the private sector to address the social inequalities that this research will identify. We expect that this research-driven process of accompanying migrants will encourage universities and their local partners to seek funding that enhances educational opportunities for migrants. Pope Francis, we are thrilled that you have opened this synodal space for students to engage in conversation with you. Would it be possible for you to meet with us again and turn this personal encounter between the Pope and university students into a tradition? In this way, Popes in the future can engage students on a regular basis and thereby listen to these indispensable members of the people of God. In turn, students can partner with popes to work synodally to promote and secure the development of and access to the goods of creation in the face of challenges brought about by globalization. Y ahora invito a nuestros estudiantes del Caribe y Centroamérica and, uh, a compartir con nuestro Santo Padre Caribbean sus ideas. America to share with the Holy Father their ideas. Un saludo fraterno, lleno de amor y paz. Please, a fraternal greeting full of love and peace. I am Leonardo Giron. I'm from Honduras and represent the Catholic University of Honduras, dear Pope Francis. One of the main causes uh, that uh, lead to forced migration in uh, our region is the extreme poverty. The poverty that is uh, especially uh, strong in the rural communities uh, where most uh, of the indigenous uh, population, uh, uh, most indigenous people live. For this reason, Holy Father, we propose to create a network that includes the university world, the church, public and private companies, and civil society. And the aim, main aim of this network would be to make a social and economic reactivation of those territories, of each of those territories. It is a hard work, but also a dynamic world that, on the one hand, would favor the systematic study of the economic and social situation of the rural communities and also about the, the, their impact on the general economy of the, each country. On the other hand, this project would stimulate and enable the development of, uh, of work, a job for everyone. So thanks to psychosocial support, training courses and uh, introduction to the uh, world of labor in collaboration with university, we can reach our aim, reach uh, our objective. For example, create uh, cooperatives that favor the introduction in the market of local products. In this way, 
giving value and uh, promoting and integrating the culture of each uh, of the cultures of rural people and uh, autochthonous uh, people. Also. Dear Pope Francis, a fraternal uh, greeting. I am Alejandro Palacio, I'm from Colombia and I represent the Catholic University of Costa Rica. Holy Father, number 33 of the Postinal Exhortation, Querida Amazonia, you talk about the importance of uh, taking care of the roots. And I quote what you wrote. Take charge of your roots because from the roots comes the strength that will make you grow, flourish and bear fruit. The countries in which we live uh, see a coexistence of many peoples, many languages, many cultures. Unfortunately, we know that if we are obliged to leave our house, uh, we are on the risk to lose this great uh, wealth of identity and also to lose the very relation with our families if we are far from them with all the social consequences that this involves. And among these, uh, the very fact that the economy of our countries uh, are supported, are mostly supported by the remittances that every day migrants send uh, to their homeland. Holy Father, in uh, Querida Amazonia, you invite us to dream uh, a new culture that develops the integral development of uh, men and women and uh, their territories, uh, a culture that enables us to safeguard the roots and uh, to guarantee a worth life, a life with dignity. So we should join in front of the limits that imposes globalization to implement these cultural dreams. And can this be considered a single mode to recover the real meaning of Catholicity that is something universal, global, and without frontiers? This is my question. Muchísimas gracias, Lorena, Paco, Leo y Alejandro. Thank you very much, Lorena, Paco, uh, Leonard, and uh, Hermano Alejandro. Francisco, hermano Papa Francisco. So, what words of wisdom would you like to share Francis, with these uh, wonderful students? What uh, words of wisdom you want to share with these uh, beautiful students? Yeah, it's uh, very touching, you know, that your words are very touching. One of you said uh, that it would be good uh, to repeat uh, this dialogue uh, between uh, the popes, and not only myself, but uh, those who will come after me, and the students. And this uh, made me think of a method, of a methodology that was used uh, when uh, fridges did not exist uh, in order to transport uh, uh, fish, because fish was put in... Uh, uh, water uh, containers and these fish tried to uh, go away they swim the, there and eventually when they arrived to the destination they were uh, really hard you know so in this way we, we should do the same we should run we should uh, you know always be in uh, good shape and you uh, keep me in good shape because the, your questions really make me think. Uh, we cannot say to young people, okay, hold on, let's see what we can do. No, we have to give uh, concrete answers to young people. So I feel like uh, a fish, uh, like uh, uh, a marker or something that moves into the water. And I'll try to answer you. You repeated the word many times, uh, the word roots. So one of the things that uh, kill a society is the very fact that you reject, uh, that one rejects uh, his or her own roots. Not only the migrants have to take care about the roots, but every one of us should take care of uh, our roots. That is why I insist on dialogue between old people and young people, because the old people are the roots, and young people are those who make the tree grow with the flowers, the fruits, etc. There's a beautiful poem by an Argentinian poet, who say that all the flowers of the tree come from uh, what they take from the roots. So every beauty, a form of beauty, every flower would not exist without roots. So it is good that you mention the roots. 
I also like the, to apply this concept to, to migrants because uh, migrants come to another country, sometimes they have to learn a different language and they learn it uh, the way they, they want. Sometimes they learn it badly. In Argentina, especially Italian migrants who did not learn the language well, we say they talk about Cocolisa, which is a, a Spanish language, but uh, badly uh, spoken. So these people, when they uh, arrive to Argentina, they have to learn a different language, uh, different habits, but without forgetting about the roots. So this is an existential question. And it is crucial that migrants uh, do respect their own roots. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we must integrate them. Uh, and uh, the receiving country must respect the roots uh, of migrants and promote them. And, uh, accompany and integrate them. It's, it's a huge work. We cannot integrate a migrant by making them forget about their own roots. No, this is not integration. This means to live with a sense of guiltiness of having sold our culture. No, we have to accompany the migrant preserving their roots. You said many things, and I took notes about what you said. So to build a network between civil society, the church, the students, this is very important. It is a key element, because this dialogue is a dialogue that the civil society needs. To listen to the students is something fundamental. And to, get, to go back to migrants, there is an element connected to integration that has to be considered with attention. I'll give you an example. Or is to say that we have to respect the rules and at the same time offer the elements of the new culture so that they can be integrated. When I went to Sweden in the airport, uh, I was almost uh, leaving the airport, uh, and uh, a young minister, a woman, uh, Minister of Culture, came to greet me. She was a young woman. And uh, she was a bit tan with the dark hair. Usually, no, Swedish are blonde. So this young woman, this minister, was the daughter of a Swedish woman and an African migrant. This African migrant was so integrated that he had a daughter who became a minister. So this means to, that we don't uh, have to ask the migrants to, to give up their culture. We have to respect uh, their culture, their songs, uh, their dances, their way to think. Uh, unfortunately, as somebody, as some of you said before, I think it was uh, the student from Honduras. Unfortunately, the economy of many countries uh, that sends uh, migrants away that uh, uh, is uh, kept alive, uh, uh, kept afloat with the remittances that these migrants uh, sent home. So migrants uh, remember about their own country in order to feed it. But maybe they don't receive something in exchange. They don't receive a return from their homeland. So to solve this tension between the roots and the new life, between the roots and the needs to be integrated into a new world. This is a crucial element. And you must always defend the roots and integration, both things. You said also many other beautiful things. But uh, I don't want to be too long in order to give room to others. So Lorena, Paco, Leo, and Alexander, would you like to uh, reply shortly to the Holy Father? Thank you, Holy Father. With you, and I believe that we believe that it's important to continue this tradition, um, to continue giving voices to the voiceless, as we have done here today for migrant communities, and uh, to continue this project. That's the only note I have, and I will allow time for Alejandro. Lorena, te doy la última palabra. Gracias, Papa Francisco, por escuchar. Uh, give you the last uh, floor. So thank you, Pope Francis, for listening to us. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you for offering us this uh, platform that enables us uh, to express ourselves, to talk to you, and also to share our ideas about how we can share this experience and build bridges between the north and the south of the world. And thanks to our students. Uh, Dr. Peter Jones, the interim dean, 
for the Institute of Pastoral Studies at Loyola University of Chicago. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. What a gift it is to be present to this encounter. Pope Francis, in recent weeks, I have had the pleasure of accompanying students who are attending universities in the central United States and in Canada. All of us were unsure of what would happen, but we all approached this work with a desire for authentic encounter, an encounter in which the group would discern together the path before them. With faith, we began. You have described the importance of listening, listening not just with our ears, but with our hearts. These students listened to each other and very quickly a frustration surfaced. We are listening, but who is listening to us? When this group met with students in Brazil, another encounter began and more shared anxiety and frustration. Young people are struggling to maintain hope. They see and experience the ravages of economic systems that treat human beings as disposable. Those same systems incentivize the exploitation of natural resources. The earth meant to support us all is itself crying out for liberation. Nonetheless, these students from Brazil and the central United States and Canada seek hope. They nurture hope together. It is my pleasure to introduce Priscilla, Jefferson, Henry, and Emily. Querido Papa Francisco, meu nome é Priscila. Yeah, Papa Francis, my name is uh, Priscilla. And uh, it is, uh, I would like to talk about the, the phenomenon of migrants who became people connected to the favelas. So we cannot think of the issue of migration without thinking how it was organized the economy in Brazil. Because we have identified and we denounce that historically, it was a deliberate choice uh, that of economists to, uh, to, to follow violent and sacrificial economic model that uh, forced uh, men and women to leave their land uh, searching for uh, uh, worth, uh, worthy conditions of life. Half of our country is still hungry. 116 million people are victims of food insecurity. We have the fourth highest rate of unemployment in the world. 13.5 million people are unemployed and 5.1 million are uh, dejected. But what is most alarming is that the sacrifice of the majority turns into a gain for the rich. The 20 richest billionaire have the wealth of 60% of the total population. Holy Father, my name is Jefferson, I study theology. I like to emphasize that this concentration of wealth creates a situation so that a restricted group of people, most of, most of men, most of them men, white men, develop themselves a, a, to the detriment of our natural resources and to the poor people. And this violent economic system forces uh, millions of people to leave their land, uh, leaving their cultural roots. Uh, and you know, only between 2000 and 2017, Brazil had 7.7 .7 million of internal displaced people. So considering the causes of this forced displacement in our country, we propose the creation of the project Permanecer, which means remain with the PAN. So in partnership with the public sector, with universities and the several institutions, the project wants to create centers for permanence, which is based on interdisciplinary, integrated and collaborative style, and act as research hubs for the promotion of initiatives and technologies aiming at a sustainable development on the local productive ecosystem, especially in peripheral regions of Brazil, where there are violations of human rights and threats to environment. Moreover, the projects want to collaborate for the reconstruction of our social fabric 
and the promotion of public policy that can guarantee the enforcement of democracy, of rights and opportunities of those who do not want to migrate and instead they want to remain, to permanence. My father, after this reflection, we realized that we must always be mindful and aware and be at the side of those who have no voice and no power. We have to love unconditionally and be bridges. But intolerance, violence, and social injustice really marked our society. How do you see our role of university students, uh, of our confession university, in the construction of more synodal society and more uh, based on solidarity? Holy Father, thank you for this encounter. My name is Henry Glenn, and I represent Creighton University, a Jesuit school in the United States. To prepare, our group dug to migration's root causes and there found the issue that profoundly worries our generation, climate change. The climate crisis is an extraordinary threat to humanity and the earth. The United Nations estimates climate change displaces 20 million people annually and researchers at Cornell University warned there could be 1.4 billion climate refugees by 2060 and 2 billion by 2100. Climate change drives migration across the globe. Some members of our group are themselves immigrants. This summer, I lived and worked in Tanzania, and when an unseasonable frost killed my host family's entire tomato crop, I was again convicted by how directly climate change affects the global poor. Catholic teaching can inspire action. The church has tremendous capacity and responsibility to act through its people, money, infrastructure, land, schools, and advocacy networks. However, our synodal group discerned a shared frustration. U.S. Catholic leaders have not prioritized church teachings about climate change and have not taken commensurate action. Last year, my co-presenter co-authored a study on Laudato Si. In more than 12,000 columns written by U.S. bishops and diocesan newspapers, less than 1% mentioned climate change. No U.S. diocese has committed to carbon neutrality and few parishes use clean energy. In our experiences, priests never discuss climate change. Our generation values authenticity and deplores hypocrisy. U.S. Catholic leaders' failure to share and enact the church's own climate teachings is disillusioning young people and our political leaders similar failure to take climate action sows doubt and cynicism among us. My name is Emily Burke. I'm also from the United States. I'm a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In response to an action and in the spirit of synodality, our group discerned a strategy that is relatively new for climate change, but celebrated across history. And this is Christian nonviolent direct action. Pope Francis, in your 2017 World Day of Peace message titled Nonviolence, a Style of Politics for Peace, you applauded the act of nonviolence of Mahatma Gandhi and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Here in the US, we also honor Reverend James Lawson and Creighton University Jesuit Father John Marcoux for their nonviolent civil rights activism. Reverend King stressed that work for justice begins with negotiation seeking conversion. When appeals are ignored, he demonstrated that Christian love necessitates active nonviolence. Reverend Lawson emphasized the need for discipline and training in the proven techniques of nonviolent direct action. This can't happen spontaneously, he said. It has to be done systematically. So given the failure of leaders to sufficiently address the climate crisis, our group proposes establishing centers to holistically train people in the spirituality and ethics of ecological conversion, skills of negotiation, and strategies of nonviolent direct action. These centers would empower people, especially young people, to meet with bishops, legislators, and private sector leaders, and more effectively appeal for science-based climate action. In the legacy of Gandhi, Marku, Lawson, and King, however, these centers would also prepare us to organize for principled nonviolent direct action if our appeals are ignored. 
Inaction perpetuates unjust violence on our common home. We have a rapidly closing window to avoid climate catastrophe that will forcibly displace millions, especially the marginalized, as climate refugees. Out of love, we feel that we must be trained to respond with the admired tradition of active nonviolence. Pope Francis, in your 2017 World Day of Peace message, you implored the world to, quote, make nonviolence our way of life. As young people eager to respond to your admonition, how do you advise that we make active nonviolence our way of life as we work to address the climate crisis? Yes. Yes. Eh, tanto Priscila como Jefferson hicieron una presentación de la violencia dura, salvaje. Uh, we, uh, they introduced uh, violence, was a uh, wild violence, uh, in a way we could say, no? So, that Brazil has always uh, lived. And uh, this by a country that uh, concerns itself uh, by uh, squashing others uh, in a way. And uh, so you are talking about uh, uh, the, the condemnation of violence uh, by building non-violent attitudes. And this is the greatest challenge uh, that we expect from you. So to give up clearly, to renounce the violence, as Priscilla said, with the concrete uh, actions, And remember that, uh, you know, there are people who defended their land, uh, who were really oppressed by violence, uh, were destroyed by violence. But you propose uh, the way of non-violence. You propose a union with harmony, of, uh, 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 with uh, nature, because uh, violence always destroys uh, uh, nature. Violence never constructs, it always destroys. We see no dictatorship. Military, non military dictatorship, they always impose themselves with destruction. No violence, on the contrary, leaves a room to others, uh, even when they think in a different way. But uh, it is based on dialogue and respect. We need the prophecy of non violence. And you are the one who has to bring ahead this uh, prophecy. It is much easier to hit someone or to insult someone instead of uh, just uh, uh, looking uh, uh, on the other side uh, or offer the other side of our face. Uh, when Mahatma Gandhi began with a campaign of nonviolence, uh, he uh, was uh, ridiculized, uh, he was persecuted uh, when he began uh, to disturb others, but uh, this way brought uh, to the independence of a nation. Nonviolence needs the strength of uh, uh, of goodness, uh, the, the, of uh, it is an attitude that comes from the first uh, uh, gesture, tender gesture of a mother towards a child. I want to emphasize also an element of faith. How is God? God has three qualities. God is close. God is merciful, and He is tender. The tenderness of God is important because someone could think uh, that God is not tender. That is not our Christian God. But God uh, uh, gets closer to us with tenderness and compassion. So getting back uh, to the violent systems, uh, thank you Priscilla for being so concrete in explaining the concept of violence. So uh, as I said, so we must act in such a way that people do not have the desire to migrate. They should be willing to remain in their land, in dialogue with nature. They should remain in this good life, as the local languages say. So a good life in harmony between the persons and nature. A good life doesn't mean to lead a good life. It is not to have fun. A good life is a life in harmony. Because when there is violence, there is no life. And also talking, uh, still talking about uh, non-violence, uh, this is the way that uh, brings us to sincerity. We have to refuse uh, any forms of hypocrisy. 
And I say this as a brother, as a father, as a grandfather, as a friend. Please don't enter the game of hypocrisy. Don't fall into the trap of hypocrisy. Never in your life. Because hypocrisy empoisons everything. You begin with a little lie and eventually you can end very badly. Without sincerity, you cannot live. Sincerity brings you ahead. Sincerity really helps you to live in harmony with ecology, with the rest of the world, helps you to live a good life in harmony with the world. So, because to maltreat a creation, uh, as we can uh, all see, this is something we always uh, see around us. There is a, a Spanish proverb that, say, that says, God forgives always, we forgive sometimes, nature never forgives. So, if we uh, destroy nature, then we create a chain of violence, uh, and we can see that uh, under our own eyes. And you both say very beautiful things. So, this uh, discourse of violence, especially in dictatorship, when people are exploited, uh, where uh, good life is taken away from them, this is sin. You spoke about violence against the creation. I met the fishermen who said that they they uh, they they captured the three tons of plastic material. This is violence against creation. So non-violence means to follow the way of sincerity. This is the real change, the real revolution. And the real liberation. Thank you, Jefferson. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you to all of you, students. Thank you, Holy Father. We appreciate your time and words of wisdom and deep experience. It is now my pleasure to introduce another colleague, Dr. Michael Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jones, Peter, my friend, and uh, apologies for the pause. Uh, just really enjoying these conversations. And I uh, it's my pleasure now to transition us into the next one. Uh, the South American and USA Canada East groups bring similar questions, uh, concerns, and concrete ideas to a complex world made all the more challenging by global pandemic. We spoke about uh, environmental extractivism, about more robust civic participation, and mostly about solidarity with folks who are displaced, the migrants, the refugees, and the forgotten ones. Uh, our USA Canada cohort, including three cherished Canadians, uh, engaged robust conversations in this way, characterized by insight, courage, and mostly mutual care. This group was thoroughly synodal from the ground up, fixed on listening and fixed on personal and communal discernment. We met our match with our South American friends as they were similarly focused, both on discernment and on the constructive relationship uh, among prayer, imagination, and concrete action. Both groups are media savvy and see expensive, or sorry, well, not so expensive, but expansive potential in utilizing digital communication technology, both judiciously, with one eye on Laudato Si, I think 108, uh, and creatively. Uh, you can see the video shorts of synodal greetings from many of our South American students on social media as they began publishing these beautiful statements more than two weeks ago. For their part, the USA Canada East community wanted to make a video for this event where all could speak, all 21 could speak. And so all voices would be heard. A great idea, but we think a bridge too far this time, but an achievable goal moving forward for meetings that follow in our synodal, in our synodal process. Our two groups met last weekend and it was a gathering characterized by creativity, joy and goodwill. These students are alive in the spirit, intellectually curious and driven, and their sleeves are rolled up for work. It is a true gift to work with these students. Here are our representatives, Eric Bazail Emil, Ana Ruiz, Santiago Varela, and Denise Rodriguez. And my thanks to Dr. Kuda for her leadership here uh, and elsewhere. And so now let's hear from our four. 
uh, these north-south bridge builders uh, selected by their peers. So Eric, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Buenos días, Santo Padre. Uh, mi amor y Basilein Mil. Soy estudiante de tercer año en la universidad estudiando política latinoamericana. I am a student in uh, Latin American politics and Africa politics, third year of university, and I'm specializing also in theology. To friendship. We observe that the inhumane conditions of migration today demand concrete responses. In our communities, we see how language barriers and unjust laws exclude undocumented migrants from access to quality health care, affordable housing, and dignified work. The gift of our diverse cultures and languages also present challenges to welcoming migrants and refugees into full participation in our societies and from creating friendships rooted in hospitality through the exchange of a common word. We students are eager to use our skills and energy to contribute to solutions to these and other injustices. For example, by creating a database of language professionals that can facilitate bilateral language learning for social inclusion and can accompany migrants and refugees through legal and medical processes that will provide stability in their lives. Brother Francis, we know that the dignity of migrants and social friendship are issues that are close to your heart. We remember your words of the 107th World Day of Migrants and Refugees in 2021, where you stated, in encountering the diversity of foreigners, migrants, and refugees, and in the intercultural dialogue that can emerge from this encounter, we have an opportunity to grow as a church and to enrich one another. We draw hope from the recent beatification of Salvadorian martyr Rutillo Grande, who preached that each member of our communities has a place at the shared table and a mission to the world. Though many in our context are already responding in informed and compassionate ways, too many Christians, including our pastors and bishops, seem unable to connect our tradition's long histories of hospitality to the contemporary realities of migrants and refugees arriving in our communities in search of safety, opportunity, and the full life God desires for all creation. Hola, Santo Padre. Me llamo Ana Ruiz y soy estudiante de Georgetown, eh, estudiando cultura y política. Es un placer hablar con usted hoy. Our dear Pope Francis, we are nothing if not filled with hope. We welcome opportunities for dialogue with our brother bishops, and we are heartened by those who make connection their top priority. But we also see around us that many of our pastors are not close to their flocks. They cannot draw strength from the witness of the faithful, and they are unable to teach others about the demands our faith makes for our work in the world. We need your advice and your help to call our bishops and bishops representing other groups here today to meet Ad Limino for a listening session facilitated by women and men who are active in struggles for ecological justice, solidarity economies, and dignified migration and refugee care and resettlement. We are hopeful to empower these struggles by inviting our pastors and bishops to learn from their people and to model service for the poor and marginalized of our societies. Holy Father, I want to conclude with some questions. As St. John Henry Newman would put it, from our heart to yours. In our continued discernment, how do we promote participation and friendship between all members of our societies? How do we support concrete local initiatives while building bridges of solidarity between different cultural and linguistic contexts? What advice do you have for us to work together as a church in our context? Gracias. Gracias, Ana. Bienvenidas, Santiago Barrera. Welcome, my friend. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Santiago Barrera. Oh, good evening, everyone. My name is Santiago. I'm from Argentina, like the uh, Holy Father. So I was accompanied in this presentation with Denise from Ecuador, and we represent Latin America, South America together. So, Holy Father, thank you for this meeting today, and we ask you to continue to fight for those who are forgotten, for those who are without voice. The Mother Earth is exploited, and the poor are the first who advocate for defending the land, but they are the first to be ignored. They are forced to migrate with the hope for a better future. They hope to find a job abroad. 
that was denied in their own land. The South America had suffered a story marked by uh, debts uh, and uh, inequality, two economic factors uh, that uh, are main causes of the process of forced migration towards uh, the north and the west, uh, but also the causes of internal migration in our countries. Uh, with a rural exodus uh, that is very important that can generate a process of uh, overpopulation and exploitation of human beings. On the other hand, the migrants suffer for uh, the stigmatization that emphasizes the throwaway culture. And uh, no one uh, uh, assumes the responsibility for this uh, because we are all responsible for this. So what uh, do we propose? We propose uh, to build uh, Alliance, build bridges and not barriers. We want to build alliances that enable to, uh, uh, to um, create solutions. So we reinforce the network of university students with the objective to uh, bring uh, in the different university areas actions that are based on a community based on empathy and brotherhood. We have the duty to create a just world than the one we received. That is one way we want to uh, elaborate bills and public policy in order to find solutions to the problem of inequality, the concentration of wealth and foreign debt. We have to raise our voice and the project and encourage strategies of alternative and solidarity economy through the creation of working workforce cooperatives that are self-run by the workers themselves, offering support and with the support of our universities. We have to generate spaces of dialogue that bring to rethink public policy that monitor the social responsibility of the companies that exploit our natural resources. We have to uh, pretend to uh, a social responsibility with the Mother Earth and we must have the courage to bring ahead this project and uh, may God bless us. So, Holy Father, our question is, uh, what is the way we should follow we young South, South American people to respond to the problems that we are facing and what concrete actions we can implement. Thank you very much. Thank you for these many things you tell me. So and he said, uh, Denis said uh, something important. It is good to hear these things uh, because the mission of university students, uh, as in your case, uh, is uh, to leave uh, a world that is a better state uh, than the one in which you live. Uh, this is the exam of consciousness that we all should do. I think this is what you meant, Denis. Am I able to leave a world that is better than the one I'm living in now? So, starting from within, not from outside, with a, a beautiful, you know, a layer of a color that can make us look better. No, we have to change from inside. So the problem of the debt is crucial because a country that accumulates debt because it takes money in loan, then the situation will get worse and worse. So in my mind, I have to wonder, shall I leave a world that is better than what we live in? And many people will say, oh, but you're young, you're an idealist, idealist uh, you, you will change. No, don't accept this. Don't negotiate your solidity. You know, you have to Put yourself at stake because in this way your heart can change and you can grow. You have to play the game. And then there is another thing that uh, uh, really impressed me. I think Eric said it. You made me think of something that uh, I already heard from uh, another person. I refer to the way of speaking to the authority of the church, leaders of the church, for example, on ecological issues. 
somebody said that uh, these ecological issues they were never mentioned that in the home it is in the church you never hear about these issues because i think that church as a whole did not take charge of the ecological issue in a serious way yet and the church very often doesn't take charge about uh, talking about many issues actually and uh, very often, yeah, you hear priests uh, saying a few things. Uh, okay, so uh, so we say, oh, but uh, they are communists, uh, so they are uh, labeled with the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, in order to to put them aside. But this is a clear gospel-based message because the change in view of a social uh, renewal is crucial. There are pastors who unfortunately are not close to their flock. I remember one of you said this. Uh, it was you, Anna. Okay. So, okay, it is true. Pastors who are not close to their flock, there is a distance between the flock and the pastor. But the pastor of the people of God is not a state clerk, a public clerk. So, either you are a priest, a real pastor, or otherwise you're just a member of the establishment and then you're not a priest. Priests must be close to their flock. This is the style of God. The style of God is proximity, is closeness with mercy and tenderness. As we said before, you know, we, we already mentioned tenderness. So if a pastor talks to you from far away, if they don't commit themselves, if they're not getting close, if they, you see they're all, you know, perfumed and well-dressed, etc., they don't get to your heart. This pastor, you know, uh, instead of attracting people, as a gospel does, as a matter of fact, they uh, surround themselves with people who are conformist, uh, they don't uh, commit themselves. I always ask uh, the pastors to be, to follow the gospel, read the gospel, do like God, be close to your people. Because a pastor who is not close to the people is a pastor who lacks something. They lack something essential. They lack the main uh, elements uh, because pastors uh, must be in front of their people in order to uh, indicate a way and they're in the middle it must be in the middle of the people to feel uh, the smell of their people and to know the concern of their people and must be behind them to take care about those who are getting lost and also to leave people to do things on their own you know, to, to manage in a way by following the Holy Spirit so pastors must be close they must be at the in front uh, in the middle and behind their people so thank you for uh, facing this topic and uh, also thanks uh, to Eric Lean for having spoken about uh, the importance of preaching ecology. So please uh, get close to your pastors. Tell them uh, we want to be close to you. We need to be with you. And we pastors, we need to be with our people. So, we are convinced that uh, we both need one another. I need you, and you need me. Santiago, for example, he mentioned the, the overpopulation of the big cities uh, because of uh, rural migration, because com countryside is abandoned, there is uh, no uh, work, so people go to the cities. And a, a sort of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, big structure of people uh, around the cities uh, uh, who are often, these people are alone, they don't have people of reference, uh, very often they don't have the minimum to survive. These people often live in an in incredible uh, misery, uh, in extreme poverty, like in this uh, favela, in these slums uh, around the city. These people, in their own land, uh, they were very well, they lived well, they had a house, uh, they had something uh, to eat. Uh, now they live very badly. They live as miserable because of this forced migration. So it is a descending curve, the one that we see now. I remember once uh, when I was a bishop in Buenos Aires, uh, somebody told me, you know, there is an empty uh, factory, but uh, it is occupied by some families. 
So one afternoon I went to visit them. I went there, I went to see, not as a bishop, as a simple priest, you know. So I went there, I said, uh, I am a priest, a uh, Catholic priest, I come to visit you, do you need something, uh, like a baptism for some uh, child, I don't know. Oh, please come in, they said, and this factory was a big group of families. And I saw they had good furniture, so what happened? There were families that little by little, they were, you know, their capacity of survival was diminishing, so they were turning into undefined groups. Uh, they were all piled up uh, in this uh, uh, abandoned factory. And these are tragedies that we see so often around us. And uh, we see, you know, that the causes of migration, uh, you mentioned empathy, brotherhood, that is very good, you know, empathy, brotherhood, social inclusion. These uh, are the ways uh, to, to follow. So always remember that the leading thread of all this way is hope. Hope does not deceive, if it is a true hope. It does not deceive, because hope makes you go ahead. It pushes your head. You know, maybe you don't realize it, but this is the case. You know, there are people that when you see them in action, you see they go ahead really pushed by hope. So thank you for your commitment. Thank you for what you said. And I, as a pastor, you know, I will make a, a, an effort in order to be closer to people and serve you in the best possible way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Holy Father. I know I speak for our students when we wish we had more time with you, but I do want to echo Anna when we say, core at core, look with tour, heart to heart. Holy Father, we thank you. Now it's my pleasure and my privilege to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Felipe Legareta. Felipe, please welcome to our dialogue, my friend. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, uh, Santo Padre Francisco. Muchísimas gracias por invitar a estos... Thank you, for Francis. Uh, thank you very much for inviting these uh, young university students uh, to the Synodal meeting to listen to those who are there, uh, to the periphery of society. Thank you for inviting, and I want to thank, uh, thank you for reminding the importance of hope. So, and, uh, you know, the causes of migration, the identification of the causes of migration are not statistics, it is a denunciation, a prophetic denunciation. A strong denunciation interwoven with the stories and the faces of men and women of any age, any race, any belief, and social condition. The uh, students, uh, boys and girls, uh, they, commit, they engage themselves in building bridges of communion and solidarity. They want to take part in the mission of the people of God as agents of reconciliation. Their proposals aim to put at the service of migrants their talents according to their academic specialization or area and according to the resources that are available in the Jesuit universities of Mexico. So please, uh, Your Holiness, uh, please continue to welcome and accompany the students uh, so that they can listen and respond with enthusiasm and perseverance to the call of Jesus Christ and heal the wounds of our migrant uh, brothers and sisters. Holy Father, now I invite uh, our two, uh, the last two students uh, of our last group uh, to introduce the contributions of uh, their uh, friends uh, from Canada, uh, US uh, and Mexico. I invite uh, Maria Jose, Gabriela Rubi, Alejas Stoteluna, and Kerry Sosa to speak. Uh, Oh, Francis, how is your heart, Holy Father? I greet you in the Maja Tet Tet 
Tal language, which is the language of my ancestors uh, in the forest of Chapas. I am uh, Maria Jose Ojeda Gonzalez and represent uh, the University of Mexico City. Together, our voice uh, involves the uh, beginning of action and thought. It will be us, young people, who lead us. Because our political world leaders only think of their personal interest, even when this means to uh, trigger a war. In the Group of Mexico, we believe that before proposing, we have to recognize that migration has at least three interconnected causes that are present in our history. One of these causes is structural and systemic inequality that exists in society and in the church structures. These inequalities are due to the ethnic or national origin, to the identity, gender identity, social condition, etc. So we are different, but we were, uh, there was an engine of exclusion. There is poverty on the one hand with an un unfair distribution of the basic goods, such as access to education, access to healthcare. I think we all have the privilege to be able to have access to these rights, but our brothers, uh, migrant brothers and sisters, do not have the same rights. Why shouldn't be, they be able to enjoy the common home or take care of the common home? It belongs to everyone, so maybe we forgot this part, we forgot about this need. And another one of these causes, this inequality, is physical violence and also psychological violence, but especially the symbolic violence that was perpetrated by different actors like organized crime, paramilitary groups, uh, uh, the, even uh, the Mexican uh, governmental institutions. We realize uh, that uh, we were part of a cycle of violence of uh, stigmatization, as uh, my friend said in front of them, one of the first proposals we have is to eliminate the stigmatization of the migrants. We must be able to see these people as equal to us, not as the others, not as the enemy, as those who are different than I am. So all institutions should promote and guarantee and support basic human rights. Eliminating stigmatization means to go beyond the walls of our churches, of our universities. What we say must be turned into action. Otherwise, it, uh, uh, everything we do is worth nothing because Christ went out. Christ gives us hope. So we must be really a church in pilgrimage. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Jose Ojeda Gonzalez. I am a student of psychology at the Pan American University. And uh, I want to first to express our solidarity to the young people of Ukraine for the situation they are living now. And I want to introduce two more proposals that we students propose. First, based on the four pillars that as well can protect, promote, and integrate migrants, we have to adopt the right strategy, the social policy expressions of Christian life in order to protect these people. So my proposal is to promote attitudes of welcome, of hospitality, through dialogue of peace, where we welcome any person, anyone who must freely choose, who wants to freely choose to be part of a community. And we can do this through concrete actions, such as helping people to find a, a, a place to live, to help them with the bureaucracy. bureaucracy. So we have to promote spaces. We as university, we can promote spaces in our university by building centers, for example. So we have two questions and a request. The first question is, what do you expect from university students in relation to the actions in the era of migration to be promoters and actors in favor of human rights and human dignity of migrants. 
Second question, how can we collaborate as students uh, together with the church in order to generate uh, new ideas, uh, a new way to see migration? Uh, how can we transform uh, all of these into political actions? Uh, and uh, last but not least, a request. Uh, we want uh, you to address two appeals, one to the rectors of uh, uh, Jesuit universities of the Americas, so that we can find the active and effective forms to respond to the needs of people who migrate, who have economic difficulties, starting from the universities. And also an appeal addressed to the students of goodwill. They should not pass at the side of the suffering of people who suffer, who need, especially the migrants. So make available to them their needs, their human needs and their skills in order to help people. Thank you very much. Good evening, Holy Father. I am Alexander Sastok. I'm Colombian and represent the University in Chicago. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Inspired by this verse, I ask you, would you be the one who opens the door for my people? My people are those who try to cross and fight hard, but their dreams will differ. They pass away with their flags in hand. They had a dream and their dream is mine. I was fortunate to secure a scholarship to study in the United States. I took a leap of faith. I have to learn a new language. I miss my family and my culture. I have many jobs, jobs that I never imagined, such as a butcher, landscaper, construction worker, a nanny, anything to achieve my goal. I even feel that I will never, enough, I will never be enough for my Colombian people or for my American people. But I was always blessed with a family who encouraged and support me to succeed. Political instability in the United States almost jeopardized my dream of completing my education at Loyola. In 2020, government left me and thousands of other international students when or center D, not knowing if we were going to be deported. My story is the same as many others. There is a lot of frustration with the increasingly toxic narrative that surrounds immigrants and displaced people. We are often described with this humanizing language. We are in rapers, murderers, drug addicts, drug dealers. We are dreamers, hard workers, people who offer the best to this or any country. We are hopeful by working together as students, we can build bridges that should have already been constructed. We want to be part of the love that provides directions, encouragement and support for others to achieve a good life. So I ask you, would you be the connection of the continent of hope? Podemos hacer lío juntos. Buenas tardes, Santo Padre. Mi nombre es Katie Sosa. Yo estoy representando la Universidad de Regis. Just evening, a... I represent also a, a university. You hold the power to those who feel powerless. We can plan to create awareness, to let those who identify with us know that we can hear them. We will speak for them, not to minimize them, but to build them up, to broaden the narrative. As a group that has concluded that there is no such American dream, we propose using technological advancements to do a podcast that includes the voices of people everywhere across borders, facing the decision to migrate, displacement, and assimilation. This will explore works done by everyone, including the latest research, making sure to highlight the stories of all. This brings us into our unity of mind and heart. We aren't separate groups of people. We're all human and deserve to be heard with no judgment. We ask for special attention to priestly formation, teaching them the theology and relevant moral principles with clear expectations for the implication of their role. We ask to not close any more churches as they can be transformed into our homes. We ask for academic leaders to be educated through special training about immigrants and how to aid an undocumented individual. We want awareness from all. We ask for union among those who have high influence. We ask for priests and public figures, artists to correct and broaden the discourse to highlight that my people aren't to be feared, they are to be heard, understood, and helped. You have challenged, you have issued a challenge. Do not be afraid, do not yield to fear. Many leaders and many institutions respond with fear and close the door on the stranger who seeks shelter, the sons and daughters of our Lord, those who have died with their rosaries in hand. We ask that you help us change these systems and lead the church to be an institution with open doors. Will you walk with us as we express the power of the spirit and help those who lost their strength trying to grasp onto a lost dream? 
Thank you. Muchas gracias, mis queridas estudiantes. Thank you very much, dear students. Uh, Holy Father, I invite you to respond to the, these concerns uh, of these young people who shared with you the dreams and their vision. Thank you for your words. So I want to begin with the first word of Aleja. You really hit the target. We will have to talk about the migrants, how to uh, talk to the migrants, but we have to think of it. It is something universal. Quoting Matthew 25, I was hungry and you fed me. I was alone and you welcomed me. This is the protocol, a protocol to adopt for everything. So, thank you for uh, mentioning these words. These are simple rules. These are rules uh, to follow every day. And the fact that uh, a, a girl says that uh, makes me think, uh, uh, thank you, it is a prophecy. And also the narrative, the pejorative, uh, the worsening narrative on migrants. Because there is always uh, this work we have uh, to, to do. Migrants uh, are always stigmatized. I'm thinking of uh, my land. For example, if I am black, there is always uh, the despise of society. Society in front of the migrant. But uh, that migrant uh, was uh, exploited. Uh, he, uh, they make him pay without paying what is fair to him. So he's, uh, he becomes a, a victim. He's a victim of uh, inequalities. I think uh, Ruby uh, said that. It's a victim of structural inequalities, he say. You know, poverty, the, the bad distribution of resources, uh, and the physical are violence uh, as well as psychological violence because uh, psychological violence uh, you know is like uh, telling you okay don't don't, uh, don't get in, into this it is not your business and this uh, eventually brings it to a degradation in people also like very much the fact that you greeted us in the language of your ancestor so it means you didn't forget about your roots. And it is important to know that you come from there. You, you know, it is good not to forget about uh, uh, our roots because you, these roots became jewels for you. So this fact of taking away the stigma from the migrant, uh, the migrant who is condemned by all the causes that you mentioned, this is an important point. It is the proposal of a pilgrim church that is not static. It is important because a static church is a, is a museum church. A synodal church instead should not be a closed church that uh, doesn't uh, worry about, the, 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 doesn't take care about the life of anyone and uh, that is uh, uh, alien to anyone. No. I remember once in my town, I saw that in a neighborhood in a, uh, for uh, Christmas and uh, for Easter, the priest uh, turned the church into a big uh, table in order to invite uh, all the uh, migrants who didn't know for who, with whom they could uh, celebrate the feast. So that was uh, for me a, a slap that changed my heart. Because they thought that this is the house of God. It is uh, when, uh, where people feed you, where people take care of you. So open your heart to a church that does not defend herself in the walls. The real church of Jesus Christ. So the, the temple, the way uh, Jesus used it. And what was uh, the temple used by Jesus? It was the, the road, a church that goes down. 
in the road. This makes me uh, remember a text of the Revelation that says, I am the door and I knock. If somebody uh, opens to me, I will enter and I will get in. So Jesus sometimes knock at my door almost to get out. No, the church has to get out of the door. This is the synodal aspect that, that, that you uh, that you spoke about. And what the, do we expect from university students? Okay. So that they go down in the road, that they commit themselves, that they show their face, that they are the consciousness of this sense of instability with which a society tries to fascinate us, like the enchantment of the uh, snake that fascinates us uh, with its uh, false uh, serenity and uh, we eventually hide everything under the carpet, you know, or it's a drawer. So it is very good what you say that to, to destigmatize, to take away the stigma. I like this. It was very good to uh, listen to your words. You were the last one who uh, gave uh, a contribution and my, maybe uh, some of the things that I said were good to you, but uh, I assure you that what you told me was very good to me. And I get out of here being different than the way I came in. So you can change others. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you because your words give us hope and to continue this process. And uh, uh, the meeting with you gives us a possibility to build bridges now and in the future. So thank you, Holy Father, and to thank you to all the students who took part uh, in this uh, dialogue. And uh, now to conclude, I give the floor to uh, Miss Kuda, uh, who will conclude this synodal encounter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Holy Father, for your time, for dedicating us at this almost two hours. And thanks to all the students, but especially I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, His Eminence uh, Cardinal Mario Grech, who is uh, the person responsible on this uh, 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 synod, on this uh, path of synodality. So he enabled us to open this dialogue, a synodal dialogue that he has so much at heart, a dialogue with the university. Thanks also to Cardinal Wallet, who is president of the commission. Thanks to Cardinal uh, to Ger, thanks to Michael, to Peter. Uh, thanks to all of you for having shared this pathway that brought us uh, to this uh, point. Thank you, Dr. Kuda, and thank you, Pope Francis. I also want to thank the dicastery for promoting integral human development and the Congregation for Catholic Education as collaborative partners in this synodal encounter and process. But my deepest thanks goes to all the students. You accepted our invitation without an understanding, but with a great hope. Your aspirations inspire us all, and we pledge to continue supporting your work together. This dialogue, Building Bridges North-South was just the beginning. It launches the Building Bridges Initiative, which has a distinct purpose. It will continue to nurture these student groups as they pursue their projects together. In cooperation with our friends in these Vatican offices and with partnering universities across the world, we will create more connections and in new directions. The initiative will form people for authentic encounter, support their listening and collective discernment and help them transform their visions into concrete actions of love and justice. The Building Bridges Initiative exists to pro study, promote and facilitate synodality as a concrete mode of collaboration across all borders. It will lift up and center the voices of those at the peripheries of society, nurture connections among disparate groups and support the agency of young people to lead us. We invite you all to consider the synodal way, everyone watching, learn about the process and its applications. Catholic or not, Christian or not, synodality as a method works and can bring together all people of goodwill. 
if you want to help us in the promotion of synodality, if you want to collaborate with others with the help of this initiative, if you want to follow and participate as this work proceeds, then let us do it together. Caminando juntos. We now turn back to Pope Francis to offer a final blessing for all those who are here and who bear witness to this encounter. Para todos Your Holiness. Los que están aquí. Y para todos los que dan testimonio de este encuentro. Pido a Jesús que los bendiga. Pido al Padre que los cuide. Jesús, que los bendiga. I ask uh, the Holy Father to push us in uh, hope, to bring us ahead. And uh, please don't forget to pray for me. Thank you.